How come no one talks about Syria anymore? Isn't the devastation and genocide that took place there worthy of discussion, escalation or action? 300,000 civilians killed with over 13 million displaced, both internally and externally. And what for? A nation that has shattered politically, socially and economically into a million different pieces. Does the country exist anymore? Some will say that Syria's current lack of exposure in the media is about news cycles and that Syria is not worthy of headlines anymore. COVID came and went and handed off the cycle to the Ukrainian-Russian war. And most recently, the resurgence of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Four years and almost no mention of Syria in the media. Syria hasn't been on our minds and hence has neither been in our hearts. Throughout history, all stories that have been told and that resonated fully with listeners, readers and viewers necessitated a protagonist and an antagonist, a confrontational narrative between good and evil. Syria suffers greatly from this predicament. There is no good or hero in Syria's story. And unfortunately, there are way too many bad players. In fact, everyone in Syria is the bad guy. And that's why we don't hear much about it. That's why everyone, the West, the Arabs, the Muslims, they all turn a blind eye towards the atrocities and genocide that's been plaguing the crisis over the past years. And why? Because no one wants to be associated with the crimes that have been committed by each and every side. And the victims, the only ones in the story that aren't evil, are the Syrian people. So aside from the only victims and the genuinely suppressed and suffering people in the mix, who else is involved? Well, let's start with the incumbents, the Syrian Arab Republic who had been fully in control of the nation up until the breakout of major revolutionary actions that subsequently led to the Syrian civil war in 2011. Headed by Bashar al-Assad, a Alawi who represented the in-power minority Shia regime, the nation had been a police state with few freedoms and with a failing economy due to significant internationally imposed sanctions because of its allegiances with Iran and Hezbollah, as well as Syria's constant interference in Lebanon's politics and stability. Approximately 64% of Syrian lands are under the control of the Syrian Arab Republic, with approximately 10 million of the population residing in these territories. The Syrian National Coalition, the SNC, are the opposition, the ones who rose in rebellion and demanded an alternative to the Ba'athist party and its authoritarian rule. The SNC is representative of Syria's significant Sunni majority, which stands at 64% of the entire population. They're actually a group of associated opposition groups who have consolidated their effort to oust al-Assad and have, over the past 10 years, gained international Western recognition as the only representative of the Syrian people. Just over 4 million Syrians reside in the opposition-held areas and control approximately 11% of Syrian lands. The Autonomous Administration for North and East Syria also known as Rojava, and its military arm, the Syrian Democratic Forces, are the third antagonist. Rojava are a Kurdish-majority-led player in the Syrian conflict and represents an ethnic coalition of Kurds, Arabs, and Assyrians that include over 2.6 million Syrians. The region gained its de facto autonomy in 2012 and controls over 25% of the overall Syrian territories. At the outset of the civil war, the Islamic State, ISIL, was a major factor in the Syrian crisis, but more recently has seen its impact diminish. Yet it remains an important figure in the instability of a nation. With small pockets of areas of insurgency operations in central and eastern Syria, ISIL is yet to be fully overcome and maintains disruptive aggression, targeting a status of continuing chaos. And last but not least, Al-Nusra Front, an Al-Qaeda affiliate, is another Islamic ideological proponent for a new Syria that has rejected any democratic systems of governance and has sought the establishment of a Sharia-based Islamic State in the country. As with ISIL, Al-Nusra's involvement has also diminished greatly over the course of the last several years. Now that we've completed the listing of the Syrian antagonists, we'll shift our attention to the non-locals supporting their proxies and who play the more significant part in the current state of affairs. We'll start with the Russian Armed Forces who are supporting the incumbent Syrian regime with full force, with funding, with armament, and with soldiers on the ground. Next in line are the United States Armed Forces, 
who are supported by their British, French, and Israeli counterparts. This alliance initially had significant numbers of boots on the ground while supporting both the Syrian opposition as well as the Kurdish alliance in the northwest of Syria, and is highly active in militarily, tactically engaging with ISIL and the Nusra Front. Then we have the Turkish armed forces, who are supporting the Syrian opposition, but more importantly, is actively engaged in fighting and breaking up the Rojava. Its intentions are to disintegrate any hopes of a potential independent Kurdish state along Turkey's southern borders. And finally, the Iraqi armed forces, who even though are themselves struggling with the likes of ISIL and Al-Qaeda back home, have engaged with the Nusra Front and ISIL across the Syrian-Iraqi borders. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. So as a quick recap, the Syrian civil war is a conflict over a decade long that has seen over 600,000 people killed in total, with war crimes and genocide taking place, and with no real tangible solution on the horizon. And now that we know who was involved in the devastation of the nation, why did this happen in the first place? The events in Syria followed the momentum of the region. The Arab Spring saw many uprisings and protests by the people calling for the end of oppressive and tyrannic rule. Tunisia and Egypt fell to such revolution. Syria also appeared to have the same cycle of unrest and revolt. But unlike the two North African nations, the Syrian government confronted these rallies with extremely harsh and deadly responses. In turn, the nation collapsed into an all-out conflict that included new resistance movements across the Syrian landscape and from a diversity of major and minor political and ideological players and agendas. Syria was being punished for its allegiance to Iran, and such punishment came in the form of sanctions that started to strangle the economy. Such an affiliation would lead to the addition of Syria into a grouping George W. Bush termed as beyond the axis of evil, that would also include Cuba and Libya to the main axis of Iran, Iraq, and North Korea a branding that would come a year prior to the U.S. invasion of Iraq that would start the isolation of Syria from the rest of the Arab world. Furthermore, Syria was the sole remnant nation in the Middle East to have maintained its allegiance to the USSR and its more modern iteration, the Russian Federation. And hence, the West strategized to disrupt such a partnership. Everything that happens at such a scale and aggression in the Middle East that involves foreign Western intervention has to do with energy, meaning petroleum. And although Syria was not known for its rich natural resources, its lands were positioned ideally for the linkage of the Gulf's natural gas exports to Europe, via proposed pipeline called the Qatar-Turkey pipeline that would run from Qatar through Saudi Arabia into Syria and at the end in Turkey. Such a proposal was supposedly shot down in 2010 by the Syrian leadership in defense of the dependence of Europe on Russian gas. Such a rejection brought about a move by the Western intelligence agencies to light a fire of discontent amongst the Syrian opposition. With the majority of Syria's population being of Sunni denomination, and since there's always been some type of sectarian unrest within the nation, one cannot shy away from the possibility that the events of 2011 were triggered by a theological power struggle. If we look at the collective antagonists, they're clearly delineated by a Sunni and Shia division. There's only one Shia player, and that's the incumbent regime, while the opposition and other paramilitary factions are all Sunni. With the hostilities subsiding, what does the future hold for Syria? The Syrian regime has retaken control of a majority of the nation, almost 64%, and through a military agreement formalized with the Kurds, another 25% of the country was now under pseudo-Syrian military control. And with the current stalemate came the return of Bashar al-Assad onto the international scene once again. Was Syria better or worse off? Which reality was it going to be? The prodigal son returns or the war criminal reintroduces his iron fist suppression? Soon thereafter, many Arab nations re-recognized the Syrian regime as the rightful government and removed the sanctions that had been imposed on the regime, hoping that the normalization of relations could lead to added stability and safety in the region. 
Al Asad's track record festered in the realms of evil, and how he had decimated his nation and people. But for the moment, he might also be a necessary evil, in the hope that Syria can get back to some kind of civil state, where there is law and order, even at the expense of individual freedoms. Now is not the time for politics, it's a time to survive and to rebuild. Ultimately, and from a humanity perspective, it's all about the Syrian people. Today, they don't really care about democracy. They don't care about any luxury. They care about the fundamentals, like having a home. A home that has some semblance of safety and stability. They care about food for their children, and some level of health care and education to give their children hope in becoming what they had no opportunity as refugees to be. Syrians are beautiful people, extremely hospitable, generous, intelligent, and engaging. Syria is a beautiful country, with a diversity of culture, history, and heritage that is undeniably rich. Two significant parts of a complex and complicated equation that is now aggregating in the negative. And what is needed to be done is to go back to the basic building blocks of a nation. And if that means dealing with a regime that has done so much wrong, then so be it.